Um, it's interesting to compare Austin's introduction, his neologism of the performative and the performative utterance with Derrida's introduction of his neologism, Dittholz. I don't want to say that Derrida makes a song and dance about it, but he is explicitly concerned to highlight the semantic field of the word, its strategic merits, and he makes every effort to explain why no existing word would quite do the job. Austin, by contrast, says almost nothing at all. He says it is a new word and an ugly word. And he adds characteristically that it is not a profound word. He says the word operative, <coughs> as used by lawyers, identifying operative clauses in contracts, is very close to what he wants. But he rejects it because it has uses other than those that interest him. So he goes for a new word altogether, a word that will have the uses that interest him because he gives it those uses. Nevertheless, he makes no effort to shed light on the particular choice of word. Still, all's well that ends well, as one might say. And at a conference at Queen Mary College, organized by Marion Hobson in 2000, Derrida himself claimed that Austin's innovation was perhaps the most significant contribution to philosophy in the 20th century. This was no faint praise, but he did add a worry. The neologism of the performative had become so familiar to us that it no longer functioned effectively. It failed to act. The performative, what Derrida in Signature Event Context had called the most event-ridden utterance there is, had perhaps lost the power to make something happen, the power to make an event. In short, Derrida suggested, the performative may no longer be able to perform. Well, I'm sure it's not over for the performative, especially the performative after deconstruction. And yet there was something in Derrida's concern regarding the future performance of the performative that I think has yet to be made much of. Now, I'm not going to try to provide the kind of semantic analysis that Austin didn't go in for, but I do want to note that the old currency of performance from which Austin struck his shiny new coin has two uses which bear contrasting. First, and this is the one that has indeed become most familiar to us, is the one related to the theatrical event. Tonight's performance of the play will begin in 10 minutes. The performance is a doing of some kind. By doing something, you give a performance of a thing which is itself essentially a doing, an event in acts, an acting event, and so on. This is to the fore in a discussion of the performance of utterances, which wants to stress that they're not to be assessed in terms of truth and falsity, in terms of truth conditions, but rather in terms of various infelicities in appraising actions. But one kind of infelicity or felicity regarding a performative is part of the concept itself, and it's the one Derrida remarked on when he said it might fail to perform. Here the use is not the theatrical one, but the operational or functional one. In Monday's news, for example, there was extended discussion about the performance of the England team the dismal performance. And we talk of the performance of shares over a period. We talk of how or whether someone could perform sexually. Certain engine oils and insurance companies and pension funds are said to be high performance. Certain drugs and foods are said to be performance enhancing. Some things help you perform, others diminish your capacity. Familiarity Derrida suggested, was wearing off the novelty of the performative, and it was no longer so potent. The performativity of the performative was in question. Well, I say all this to introduce a reference to a use of the concept of performativity, which made its way in Jean-François Lyotard's groundbreaking text, The Postmodern Condition, A Report on Knowledge. It always struck me as interesting that he dared to call it a report, 
because that covered over how far what he was doing was also an intervention. It was not merely a quantitative <coughs> assertion about how things are, but also a writing event which made things happen. It performed. Indeed, it performed in the context of a discussion whose own object was, as he put it, the use of funds of knowledge dedicated to optimizing the performance of a project. And there is, of course, explicit discussion under the rubric of what he calls the language game method, a big signing reference, of course, of what Lyotard explicitly cited as performative utterances. What seems to go unnoticed, however, is how it is the functional or operational aspect of performativity that's deployed in Lyotard's subsequent analysis. For having introduced the Austinian idea of performativity in language, Lyotard goes on to highlight its person pertinence in Talcott Parsons' understanding of society as a self-regulating system. And here I'm going to be a quote from Lyotard <coughs> talking about Talcott Parsons' understanding, and he's going to interpolate a, an important word in here. So this is Lyotard on Parsons. The true goal of the system, the reason it programs itself like a computer, is, and here he puts in a word of his own, as it were, not his own, performativity. Even when its rules are in the process of changing and innovations are occurring, even when it's, it, these dysfunctions, its dysfunctions such as strikes, crises, unemployment, or political revolutions inspire hope and lead to belief in an alternative, even when what is actually taking place is only in even then, what is actually taking place is only an internal readjustment, and its result can be no more than an increase in the system's viability. The only alternative to this kind of performance improvement is entropy or decline. Well, no doubt it would be misleading and total simplification to think that Lyotard simply accepts everything in Parsons' analysis. But his text continues to appeal to the idea of the performativity of the system. Indeed, it's clear that Lyotard thinks that as far as an understanding of advanced post-industrial societies is concerned, a focus on the politics and on the economics of the optimization of performativity, this kind of political economy, is something that he thinks cannot be avoided. Performativity is Leotard notes, a term presently embedded in the world of business affairs. This is evident, for example, from a glance at the kinds of language moves, what he calls the kinds of language moves, that are privileged in different institutional settings. Here's a quote from <coughs> orders in the army, prayer in church, denotation in the schools, narration in families, questions in philosophy performativity in business. However, Lyotard does not find this kind of institutional analysis wholly satisfactory. It is, he suggests, too unwieldy, unwieldy, too reifying. And he insists that the limits the institution imposes on potential language moves are never established once and for all. With the time that I've got with you today, I want to exploit the possibility of language moves beyond the limits of existing institutional conventions to engage in a certain creative performativity or performative novelty which attempts to make something happen, to happen to instituted conventions, in order to help make performativity perform once more. In a lecture delivered in Prague in 1935, Edmund Husserl introduced a worry he felt regarding what he called the worldview of modern man. That worldview was one that had, he thought, turned away from the questions which are decisive for humanity. These are questions, he says, concerning the meaning or meaninglessness of the whole of human existence. Blinded by the astonishing success of the natural sciences, modern